So I'm I'm Wim Lavin. I'll be the facilitator today, and it will take basically no effort um, to do that. Um, but but what else I get to do is kind of talk about the organization and the conference for just a second to to frame where this conversation, um, this presentation fits into this larger arc, which is to say that there is. Uh, the Peace and Justice Studies Association, which is putting on this uh, virtual conference this year. Um, and we've done so by breaking up content into three months so that we started with restorative justice um, and moved to a storytelling narrative use in, in our processes for restorative justice. And now we're in our third month where uh, the overarching theme is polarization. And we knew that polarization was kind of the key point to the conference from the very beginning, because it's always been well known that in addition to all of the other conflicts going on around the globe, that the 2020 uh, presidential election was going to be particularly divisive. And as activists and academics and practitioners and just good citizens, we knew that we needed to talk about these things, to talk about what, what are we doing, what's working and what's not working. So the Peace and Justice Studies Association is the North American affiliate of the larger global organization, the International Peace Research Association. And I highly promote both of our organizations. If you like the content you're seeing, I really do hope that you take a look. I'm pretty sure just about everybody in this call already is a member, but for those who might see the recording, please go to the website. We have affordable memberships. Um, please look at, this is the last part of the sales pitch. Please look at the upcoming programming we have. Um, it's the last week kind of, we will go to, through next weekend, but We've got content almost every day this, this coming week, including our, our final keynote, which to my knowledge is kind of groundbreaking. We will have our final keynote come from prison. We will have an, an inmate uh, talking about polarization um, from behind bars. Um, I do hope that you can attend. I hope that you can make it to everything. Um, but for now, we have three great presenters. Um, people who I, uh, I'm very excited to hear from, and um, thanks for being here. And Janet, I'll let you, uh, you have the floor. Thanks for, thanks so much for that introduction, Wim. I want to thank, first of all, uh, the Peace and Justice Studies Association for working it out for us to have this conference and employing constructive creativity and social coordination, as well as technology to make it happen. So it's a really a positive methodology for peace education and hopefully for depolarization and integrating society despite our, our uh, difficulties. My name is Janet Gerson. I'm the education director of the Peace Education Center founded by Dr. Betty Reardon, and uh, um, I am working with Dr. Dale Snoward of the University of Toledo and Dr. Jeff Warnicke from the... Walsh University. Walsh University, thank you. Try not to do that, Paul. We have been working on a relational paradigm for justice, peace, and democracy for several years, reading and presenting many times at Peace and Justice Studies Association. Uh, so I'll start and present the problematic. Jeff will elaborate on um, the problem, the more specific problems of propaganda ideology and using Rainier Force, the uh, importance of understanding tolerance and Dale Snower will uh, 
address, use John Dewey and the public, as well as Liliana Mason's writing on uh, um, uh, polarity. I also want to um, say that in our, in our readings on democracy, peace, and justice, and trying to conceptualize it from a re relational perspective that, uh, that and given the, the Ferguson and then all the other killings by state agents, police, and uh, the big uprising, particularly recently with George Floyd's death, we uh, have been reading a lot going back to the time of Martin Luther King Jr. And I'm particularly interested in his nonviolence and also his uh, liberal conception where he doesn't go either with capitalism or Marxism or socialism, but it's just trying to play a broader uh, integrating and inclusive form philosophical background for making an actual democracy, something that he says uh, has been promised for since the founding of our country without uh, people really being able to cash in on that claim. Okay, so the problematic um, first of all, and second of all, we submitted our proposal on April 17th, 2020. Can you believe that was the same year? <laughs> Everything has changed so much. Uh, we have a pandemic, quarantine. We have an, uh, an economic recession. The schools have been closed and the threat of losing public education has gotten all the more prominent. Um, these problems have revealed Trump's failure and his lack of concern for people, his inability and actually his, re his uh, sneering rejection of distributive justice and management of the country as a whole. And um, we have also seen the leaders in the White House uh, support white supremacy and dismiss a lot of the responsibilities of democracy. We've seen a rise in inequities that have been laid bare by, by all of these crises. And in this moment, for example, I live in New York City, one third of the renters, it said, have not been paying rent. And the, the costs of dealing with the pandemic and trying to prop up and maintain, keep alive the institutions has been extremely expensive for New York City, New York State. And the federal government has uh, not been very helpful. So the government, the Congress failed to present, uh, pass a second uh, financial support package for citizens and uh, we're facing another wave of the COVID without better systems of distribution of uh, protective equipment. But the irony is that the stock market is doing extremely well. Why is that? Uh, I think it speaks to the domination of our governance by neoliberal ideology and neoliberal policies. Right now we're in, uh, we've been facing in this period threats, chaos, confusion, disparities and polarities. It's the aim, according to Wendy Brown and her book, Neoliberalism in Ruins, that neoliberalism aims at, quote, disint to disintegrate systems of society, democracy, and moral values. And we are also experiencing the very 
I think, a very lame and weak mechanism to blame so that uh, the, the a virus, a pandemic virus is no person or government's fault. But people believe it came from Ch blame China, blame the Democrats, blame etc., which is um, a real uh, a result of obfuscation and displacement of the possibility of actual democratic conversations where we work on problem solving. So that I think is partly what Wendy Brown means in her title, neoliberalism in ruins. Um, she, we may think of, so to define neoliberalism a little bit, not extensively, but a little bit, um, we've all heard of from the Reagan era of trickle down economics, let the market be free, the economic will cor correct itself, just rely on, um, Consumerism. So, for example, it, when George Bush responded to the 9 11 bombings and terror acts, he, he said, after a couple of weeks, he said, We can solve this. People go shopping, go shopping. Really? That's the answer? Uh, I think that answer. reveals how he is speaking for neoliberal uh, uh, theorists who are working for global elites and what uh, econo economist David Harvey calls capitalism by extraction. This is different from what, what Martin Luther King Jr. would say, which is, oh, it's all right for people to try to further themselves, better themselves, make more money, get more financially secure. But capitalism by extraction is a means by which wherever there's money or something flourishing financially, there's uh, an aim to uh, take control of that, be it uh, an industry, uh, the, the development of a vaccine to fight the COVID or uh, uranium or, or uh, important metals in Afghanistan, Colombia, Nigeria, et cetera. And um, we also see that um, this financialization of the economy where the market does well, but the producing of, for example, uh, important uh, protective masks for the population and healthcare workers and um, essential service workers ha has not been really accomplished. So neoliberalism is also globalizing. So it transcends the regulatory powers and the structures to protect people which governments and states provide. They may not be perfect, of course, government, states, and regulation. We all may have our critiques and arguments with that. At the same time, they provide, or we may have thought in the past, a stabilizing and equalizing structures or potential for that in uh, state mechanisms, government mechanisms. The markets, the market um, intentions and uh, it, it, neoliberalism is both a market project and a morals project. Market values supersede human society values, values of human security. Morals, as we've been discussing in our group, are the values we need amongst humans to coordinate human society and protect the dignity, the respect, and the well-being of the people and the land and the environment, which we all need to live. Neoliberalism and its actors 
are, this is less well known and less acknowledged, attack democracy and the will as a kind of will and consensus of the, of the people and attempt to dismantle it. Deregulation, regulations are often um, argued for by populations, workers, people in various locales to protect the health and well being of the citizens. Um, but neoliberalism's aim is to supersede the will of the people through deregulation. In other words, they replace the government, they aim to replace the government purpose as serving the market corporate to, to replace, sorry, to replace government as a service for and by and of the people to government's purpose as being serving the market, corporations, wealth, and this extractionist capitalism and hierarchical or hegemonic uh, arrangements like white supremacy and patriarchy. Um, as it, you may have seen in The Intercept, John Schwartz wrote an article saying everything in the, that the Trump era is total failure. Uh, both a failure of everything and everyone in office. And I think he's referring to this nihilistic and fatalistic uh, uh, disorganizing purpose for people, citizens, and societies that's instilled by neoliberalism. Brown, uh, Wendy Brown calls it a, for, a, and it allows for a ferocious eruption of social political factors and issues. Sheldon Wollen calls it an enraged form of um, majority rule. Do you hear the trucks on my street? Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you, no, no, no trucks. No trucks, no fire engines, no dogs, okay. <laughs> All right, good. A, a, an enraged form of majority rule, which is the populism that aims to um, uh, rise up in a what some people would say are fascist or, or dis, dis, uh, violent surges. So I wanna show you being, I'm aiming for, working in a low tech in our high tech situation is um, this bell curve. Let's see, can you see it? Let me, I just like to be on the, oh, let's see. Can you, oh, there we go, my bell curve. Okay, so in this bell curve, it aims to show something like a stable society in which there are extremes. There always are extremes. They're always there, but the majority of the society, there's a, a, a sort of a rise in the well being, and that's supported by norms and values and a story of how, for example, in the United States, we're one country, we share values like the rule of law, democracy, equality, and you know, the value of voting and electing representatives. But the theory of this, this good times, stable times says that in, in um, like for example, in capitalism by, by dis extraction, people and society lose this curve of well being and it starts to collapse. So that it, at the current, in our current era, we have a kind of a, conditions, crisis conditions. So the bell curve has flattened and people, all kinds of people in all kinds of situations and settings and contexts are suffering and feeling threatened and chaotic. At the same time that the polarized ends uh, have risen up uh, like that threatened fascism, violence, and disorganization. 
So that's the problematic. We aim to challenge that with our scholarship relations education. And on that note, I pass the microphone to our next speaker, Jeff Warnke. Thanks, Janet. I'm gonna see if I can get this uh, screen to share here. Uh, let's see, I start. And let, while Jeff is setting up, let me suggest that you think about questions, compliments, <laughs> and challenges you might want, points that you'd like to enhance, uh, uh, because we'll have time for questions, answers, discussion afterwards. Thank you. Um, so in, in this discussion, I'm sort of exploring these, this idea of demagogic propaganda um, through sort of this lens of democratic theory delivered at democracy, um, considering sort of the challenges to sustaining liberal democracy from the inside. Um, in this discussion, I'll explore some of the key elements of um, Jason Stanley's work, how propaganda works, um, with an attention to mechanisms that make it effective in liberal democracies. So the aim of this work is, um, according to Stanley, was to show that democracy requires material equality and to forge an argument for this view without premises about morality or justice, but rather in, in a case of the effects of material inequality on what he calls pernicious epistemic effects. While I see value in his inquiry and contend there is much to learn from it, I suggest that the correctness of the claim must be considered in light of basic tenets of deliberative democracy, morally grounded, and what Rainer Force calls the right to justification. Um, epistemic justice should be situated in this right to justification, which aims to secure universal basic human dignity. Um, this presentation is not intended to be an exhaustive study of propaganda itself, but to look at the contributions of Stanley's work um, to our current understanding. Um, as many have shown, propaganda presents a serious challenge to the vision and practice of democracy and the ideals of contemporary de deliberative models that are a cause for concern here. Um, most notably, I think Herman and Chomsky's uh, um, work, Manufacturing of Consent, it comes to mind. So I want to begin by situating the discussion in discourses of justice from the political liberal tradition and conceptions of deliberative models of democracy that emphasize the reciprocal and mutual um, recognition of rights and duties commensurate with moral judgments of equal inherent dignity. The individual is centered as the basic category of moral consideration. Participation in democratized social practices is fundamental. The idea of public reason then is focused upon communication or deliberation and transparency is central to the mutual and reciprocal interests, the processes and procedures of justification that are the basis of informed judgment, decision-making and consent. Um, of note, uh, recent research by Fishkin and others have uh, shown that when given valid information, deliberative bodies of diverse citizens can find consensus and form sound impartial choices in a deliberative decision-making context. Um, this research points to the plausibility of this democratic model under certain conditions and under certain contexts. Um, there are some criticisms that we must confront um, if, if we're going to uh, sort of follow this vision. So an ancient argument against de democracy with oranges in Plato's Republic continues to be resounded in the criticisms of democracy from popular critics to authoritarians and totalitarians alike, as well as implicitly embedded in the ideologies and agendas of governing elites, even in what appear to be functioning liberal, de liberal democracies today. This counter view holds a skepticism of the capacity of the masses to self-govern often built around theories of moral and practical superiority. They suggest that a vanguard of enlightened superior persons should guide or steer the ship of state for the masses are taken by irrationality and other forms of inferior characteristics. 
is in this propensity for irrationality driven by affective and epistemic and cognitive flaws that propaganda seize, seize upon to influence and to co coerce under the guise of an open and free society, often appealing to these values of freedom itself. So Plato's rejection of democracy was centered on this propensity of the masses to be duped by a demagogue who would incite fear and present themselves as a protector and preserver of social order. Um, I mentioned some ideologies here as preview of the role that ideology plays in propaganda. As Janet discussed um, in her presentation, neoliberalism, along with I think neoconservatism, are two ideologies that have had a pro profound influence on contemporary liberal democracies. Um, I'll discuss this a little more going forward. Um, Stanley also points to other forms of elitism, such as the technicism of bureaucratic and intellectual elites. In educational research, the field from which I come, um, the history of schooling in the U.S. is a prime example. We have seen this influence in the early formation of schooling or the influence of social Darwinists and social engineers formed what David Ty Tyak has called administrative progressivism, which was a counter um, movement to sort of what we think of progressivism in the Deweyan tradition. Um, it's a form of social meliorism driven by a vanguard of intellectual elites and social engineers. Um, these draw upon um, the ideas of Herbert Spencer and were further developed by early psychologists who suggested that intelligence and talent was an innate quality that could be measured and a proper track of education could efficiently prepare the student for the future social role. At the radical extreme of this view were the eugenicists. eugenicists. Um, the technocratic elites envisioned an educational system built around efficiency and the reproduction of social and economic classes while using the school as a means for indoctrinating new generations um, into the ideologies that preserve social order and social cohesion. In essence, using civic education in the language of free democratic societies to inculcate a sense of legitimacy and meritocracy to the system. The movement was part of the response to the waves of immigration in the early 20th century amidst fears of social change and unrest, such as burgeoning social movements for unions and civil rights and increasing enfranchisement. As Stanley demonstrates, the propagation, propagation of the ideologies are an important element in the maintenance of elite domination by setting the frameworks for which propaganda gains its effectiveness. These ideologies in effect are legitimation myths that invalidly justify structural inequality. The deliberative Democrat rejects this view on grounds that it amounts to arbitrary and partial rule. Yet in this critique of democracy, there are important aspects of human psychology and mechanisms of socialization and enculturation that must uh, be considered in light of the rigorous demand that self-governance requires. Still a fundamental rejection of the elitist form of authority is that no person or group is immune from these epistemic flaws that lead to bias and positionally confined understanding. As deliberative democratic theorists suggest, the intersubjective nature of public reason and the full inclusion of all stakeholders is vital to the estimation and expression of the ideal of justice. Um, I'll draw from Jason Stanley's discussion of propaganda and ideology and this exploration of these epistemic and cognitive mechanisms that contribute to the polarization of democratic society. Um, Jeff? Yes. Could you go a little bit louder and slower because people aren't following your... Um... Okay. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Yeah. We have time. We have time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I get going and it's like in the moment. I was trying to have my clock here so I would go slower. I always speed up when I'm on, on the... Okay. On thank the you. Was, was there a, a point that I should go back and revisit? or any questions well, about? I think just a general request in the chat. Okay. okay. Yeah. Maybe yeah. not everyone is even first language English, so, you know, that. Oh, okay, yeah, sure, I'll slow down. Um, let's see, so we're at, on this slide of um, propaganda and demagoguery then, uh, is sort of laying out some of those, the definition of, of propaganda. And I think Stanley presents as sort of a novel view of propaganda. Um, he defines propaganda in two modes. One is sort of a, a supporting um, propaganda. Um, so, and, and the other is what he calls undermining propaganda. Um, supporting propaganda then is uh, sort of, in, to quote him, employs a valued political ideal to elicit emotion. It's devoid of reason, such as ungrounded fear or ungrounded pride. 
in the service of realizing that ideal. So, in, you know, it's supporting that ideal that, that we're uh, using rhetoric to, to, um, to appeal to. Um, this form is not the focus of his book or his work so much. Um, what he's more concerned about and what he sees as a real challenge to um, democracy is, is, is this second one, the undermining propaganda, um, which he defines uh, to, to quote, an argument that employs an ideal in service of a goal that tends to undermine that ideal. In other words, he describes it as a violation of a sacred ideal, packed in the language of that ideal. So we're using the language of democracy to undermine democracy. And I think we've seen plenty of evidence of this in the past four years, especially. Um, and it, as Janet spoke about neoliberalism, this is sort of an approach of the neoliberal agenda as well, I think. And Wendy Brown does an excellent job, I think, of, of discussing that in her work. Um, so undermining propaganda is demagoguery. It is grounded by flawed ideologies that distort valued political ideals. It is presented in a way that prevents recognition of the aim, goal, or agenda of the demagogue who seeks to undermine the political ideal. Um, a classic case would be Adolf Hitler's use of the democratic processes of Weimar Republic to secure his position in power that he in turn aborts. Um, so there's a, a, a demagogic propaganda that um, Stanley contends um, aims to erode empathy. So empathy is seen as a central feature of reasonableness, reasonableness in human sociability, which are really at the heart of, I think, democratic or deliberative democratic uh, um, uh, life. Um, this is uh, connected to mechanisms of affirmation of the self and the negative attributions of categorically defined others, as in social identity theory. Um, Stanley rejects the conditions that propaganda must be false or insincere, as other theories of propaganda sometimes suggest calling these the falsity condition and the insincerity condition. He suggests that based upon flawed ideologies, the propagandist can be quite sincere based upon a false consciousness that distorts his or her reality, which aims to justify and legitimate the inequality of their social practice. So Stanley points to an important role that pop propaganda then plays in this process. Um, certainly, the, the existing flawed ideologies are a key part of the problem. Um, however, it's the use of propaganda that masks these flawed ideologies, especially when you think about it, using the language of democracy to, to harm democracy. It, it has a, a way of masking the underlying aim or goal of that ideology. Um, so it's a, it's a way of activating these flawed ideologies in service of undemocratic aims while, while appealing to what are seen as sacred ideals, such as liberty or freedom. Um, one is a partial or chauvinistic view of liberty, as in the case of neoliberalism's use of the idea of liberty, or for instance, an example of this um, kind of undermining propaganda, it uses the language of freedom and autonomy. Um, when we think about, like, I was thinking of the example of the negative rhetoric around mask wearing in the past few months. This is something that we're, we're all experiencing. Um, it's rooted in this language of freedom, right? How, how dare you, uh, uh, you know, insult my autonomy and my right to do what I wanna do kind of thing. Um, it's, it's often the basis of, the crit of their criticism. While it's an atomized cynical freedom devoid of the reciprocal and mutual concern that is really at the basis of, of um, of democratic um, values. And, and this is a way of eroding empathy and reasonableness in that domain. So I'd like to explore this concept of ideology and flawed ideology a little more precisely. I, and, and, and I'll go into that in the next slide a little bit. Switch, okay. Um, in Stanley's discussion of ideology, the concept is similar to the idea of culture. Um, it's connected to this idea of social practices. 
um, ideology allows one to navigate the social world. These are in many ways reflexive or deeply ingrained in the person. They operate as unconscious competencies that allow one to make meaning and function within the social structure and within and, and social practices themselves. In Stanley's account, the problem of ideology is linked to the prevalence of material inequality. Ideologies act on both those who benefit from social arrangements and on those who are harmed by the social arrangements. Um, they justify and legitimate the benefits of one group while justifying the unequal conditions of an outgroup. In this sense, the, um, for deliberative Democrats, these myths close off the space of reason, masking reality and views that suggest the justness and reasonableness of the arrangements, masking them as, as natural. Um, so polarization then is a symptom of this inequality. It arises from unjust social structures or social arrangements. These social structures have epistemic effects that frame understandings and meanings and social practices that support these unjust systems. So false ideologies act as justifications for these social practices. They can socially construct systems of belief that are tied to one's identity, which I'll look at more in the next slide and I think Dale will discuss as well. Um, identification involves a sense of belonging to a community. Communities defined by shared social practices and shared systems of belief or these ideologies. What follows from this is an identification that is fostered by, by this false consciousness. Um, so when we think about things like cognitive schemas, these frame our thought and meaning of the world, including our social worlds. They constrain our understanding, but also limit the capacity to imagine, perceive, and name the unknown. They, they constrain our ability to, to, for this social imagination. I think as C. Wright Mills would have said, um, such things as, to paraphrase Donald Rumsfeld, this is kind of an interesting thing to do here, I thought, but, but um, the unknown unknowns and the unknown knowns, these things that are part of false consciousness and false ideologies and are what can be described as invalid justifications. So when the schemas are connected in conceptions and theories of the world, they operate as ideologies, systematic ideologies that explain the world, but also legitimate and justify the experienced social arrangements and practices. These are formed in interaction with the social world. They are part of the socialization and enculturation processes that often become ingrained in a sense of subconscious normalcy, or what um, some have described as reified beliefs and structures. As norms, the schemas and concepts of ideologies operate to constrain behavior and the conceiving of social possibilities. For example, when someone makes a claim of injustice in the world and another suggests as rationalization that the world is not fair, it stifles the claims to justice based upon a view that what is seen in the social arrangements are somehow a condition of natural re processes, not open to the revision and redistribution of arrangements. Um, such rationalization of normalcy and natural conditions is an example of reified beliefs instantiated in the patterns of um, association and institutions in society. Um, this is a closing off of the space of reason, as I said before, through false ideologies and in invalid justifications. Nature may be unfair, but socially constructed spaces ought to be. Um, so with social practices tied to the epistemic claims of beliefs about reality, forming a sense of self and identity. Human tends, humans tend towards a, a mechanism of preservation of that self and identity, valuing and conserving the beliefs that give meaning and justification for the conditions that structure these social practices. Even when faced with information and experiences that expose the falsity or invalidity of the beliefs, the mechanism tends towards preserving the, the belief in context of, of social practice. So even when evidence, reflection and rational inquiry inform one of, of the falsity of a belief, there tends to be a return to the social practices that ground the ideologies. This is seen in the rationalization for such things as racialized academic achievement gaps, racialized intergenerational poverty and such things, where beliefs about people of color are tied to the preservation of unequal social arrangements, where, social, where stereotypical views of people of color, um, African-Americans specifically, are are seen as morally, genetically, and or culturally inferior. 
Some critical theorists have described this rationalization as, the, as blaming the victim. They are deficit ideologies that create a polarized or dialectic of inferiority and superiority, which uh, feed into sort of this uh, ideology of white supremacy. Other rationalizations that contribute to these patterns are such things as, um, as silencing of diminished value of, of the perspective of the one experiencing oppression, forms of avoidance of such topics in politics in general. We see this in, in people just tuning politics out, not being involved in the process. Um, um, we see a deflection of the root of the problem by pointing to the gaze of, in other directions. So the linkage of these reified beliefs to senses of self and identity are further connected to one's sense of connection and community or belonging to an in-group, as many social psychologists describe it, are incredibly stable over time, resistant to change even when confronted by contradictory evidence. Um, this contradictory evidence itself produces a sense of emotional dis discomfort and disorientation that can further enforce the static or conserving ep epistemic mechanisms. This presents a fertile ground for propaganda and demagoguery. In the link between ideology and the use of propaganda, what Stanley draws our attention to is the way that, idea, that propaganda relies upon existing ideologies embedded and constructed in these social practices, reified beliefs that are activated as frames of reference for the re receiver of propaganda. The mediated messages are meaningful and play upon deep and often subconscious systems of value and belief. Demagogic propaganda mass explicit speech. Um, when these uh, ideologies are connected to one sense of self and identity, or more precisely, their multiple identities, um, they, they are developed by interacting with different communities of practice. They are supported by affective affirmations and drives for a sense of belonging connection to the social in group. These affective processes drive a resistance to change or alteration when new evidence contradicts the ideologies, making them static or resistant to change over time. Um, these are demonstrated in such mechanisms as selective attention, self-confirmation bias, and self-affirmation. When um, I think a, a real danger of this is when negative attributions are attached to outgroups, this intensifies under conditions of heightened fear and threat perception. The propaganda associated reinforces dehumanization processes in what can be labeled eliminationist rhetoric, a call for the extermination of the threat within the metaphorical frames of fear, threat, fight, and survive. All this is destructive of the space of reason. It distorts, distorts the reality and the community um, and who or what we are connected to. And that is the end of mine. I am the Debbie Downer of the group. <laughs> okay. Wow, that was really powerful and well researched and explained. Thank you. Now we're looking to go for uh, Dale Snowert's um, presentation and um, to perhaps uplift us a bit. A little? I don't know. Go, Dale. Let's see. Well, uh, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Janet. Appreciate your, your thoughts, your detailed thoughts on the subject. I'm going to uh, share my, my screen here, it's my PowerPoint as well. So uh, I'm Dale Snowart. I'm a professor of education and peace studies at the University of Toledo in, in Ohio. And uh, the two central questions that I want to explore uh, in, this, uh, in this presentation is what, why is political polarization a threat to democracy and the pursuit of justice? Uh, so why why is polarization a threat? And then what, uh, what can we do about, about it? What, what is necessary to reconcile 
political polarization. So my, my point of uh, departure is, uh, is John Dewey uh, and in particular his work, The Public and Its Problems, first published in 1927. Uh, in, in that work, uh, <clears throat> Dewey uh, defined the public as that which is created by the interaction of two persons which has indirect consequences uh, for others. So the, the public from Dewey's perspective is created uh, as a body of individuals who are impacted by the consequences of, of, of an action. And uh, th that public, those persons have a common interest in the regulation of those consequences. So for example, uh, someone uh, dumps uh, uh, toxic waste into a stream that uh, waste uh, goes downstream and effect, has an effect on the lives and well-being of others downstream. Uh, those just create a public, uh, and that public has a common interest in the in the regulation of those of those consequences. In this case, uh, a simple example: the public can be, and is very complex um, because of the range of actions and consequences of of persons living in a society. Um, although uh, it, a public is called into existence by the consequences of action, and we all have a shared interest in the regulation, uh, the public tends to be uh, incolate and unorganized. And do we ask, and that's the public, that's the problem of the public. How is the public to be regulated in the common interest? is the fundamental problem of the public. Uh, the one, one answer is that the regulation of the public requires the enactment of public policy uh, via the rule of law by the state. So the regulation of the public calls into existence government and government action in order to regulate the, uh, the uh, public. And through the impartial application of law, that creates trust and makes social cooperation uh, possible in the society. Uh, furthermore, the as we'll see, the regulation of the public requires social intelligence. That is, it requires the active participation uh, of the people uh, that make up that public. So on the one hand, the state uh, the government is necessary for the effective and just regulation of the, of the public. Um, the state is the only um, entity that has the power to capable of, uh, of providing social order and the regulation of, of the public. Um, and that requires the people to enter into a social contract uh, with that power in order to uh, guarantee social order and the just and effective regulation uh, of, the, of the public. So uh, to use Hobbes's uh, phrase, uh, the coercive power of the state, the Leviathan in Hobbes's terms is a necessary requirement for the regulation of the public. Uh, the power, however, there's a, a fundamental pro uh, problem with the Leviathan uh, and that is that uh, if left unchecked, it will become despotic, uh, leading to domination and, uh, and oppression. So the, the Leviathan, the coercive power of the state, the government is necessary, but if left without accountability, without the, uh, the, the check of the power of the people, it will, uh, it will tend towards uh, uh, tyranny and, and domination, um, including, the, um, including the capture of the state uh, by elite interests. And that's, a pro that's also a problem of the public to what, what, uh, what is necessary to check the power of the government. One, one historic answer and, and uh, very important answer to checking the power of, this, of the state was 
uh, the erection of a constitutional architecture of checks and balances, the establishment of the Madisonian division of power, a architecture that divides uh, power vertically among various jurisdictions and also among independent branches of government. Uh, so built in, we, uh, <clears throat> Madison and Hamilton and others argued that uh, the way to uh, shackle the, the Leviathan was through a particular kind of ar uh, constitutional architecture, uh, which is effective uh, to a degree. However, uh, the constitutional system of divided state power alone is insufficient to curb that power. An informed citizenry is needed to control, regulate, and condition uh, the power of the state. And this analysis is based upon the work of uh, uh, Darren Asamuglu and James, Madison, uh, James Robinson in their uh, recent book, I think it's an important book, uh, the Narrow Corridor, Corridor, which is a historical analysis, a world historical analysis of, of the relationship between uh, the state and the power of the people. And they write, uh, Despot despotism flows from the inability of society to influence the state's policies and actions. Though a constitution may specify democratic elections or consultation, such a decree is insufficient to make the Leviathan responsive, accountable, and shackled unless society is mobilized and becomes actively engaged in, uh, in politics, and, end quote. So uh, citizens or the power of society are needed to control the power of the state. And the, pu the public must recognize itself in order to articulate and express its interests. And if the state is to protect the common good and not merely be a representative of elite interest, it must be informed by the public. Uh, it is on the basis of an informed, energetic and articulate public that the state serves its proper function without which it becomes a political means for the pursuit of elite private interests as, uh, as Jeff and Janet uh, articulated quite clearly. Um, the state will pursue the interests of the powerful if the public remains unorganized and unarticulated. So the democratic empowerment of citizens paves the way to what uh, Asamuklu and Robinson refer to as the shackled Leviathan. And this uh, constitutes a balanced structure. They call for a balanced structure of state society power relations. Um, and that, uh, that balance of power between the state and society uh, creates a core, what they call a corridor of liberty, a space within which liberty and justice can be pursued and established. And that's illustrated in, in this graph that uh, if the power of the state is too, uh, is, is too uh, powerful relative to the power of society, then you have a despotic, a despotic state. If the power of society is too, too powerful um, relative to the state, then you have the, an absent state, uh, usually in the form of a failed state or uh, a, um, uh, an anarchical conditions. So the, uh, the corridor is created when you have a proper balance between the government and the people and that proper balance creates uh, a space, uh, a sphere of justice, a sphere of peace within which a just and well-ordered society can, uh, can take place. So the idea is a fundamental balance between government power and the power of society, the power of, of the people. This requires uh, various pillars of democratic power, uh, free and fair elections, 
the rule of law, uh, a fundamental important aspect is the legitimacy of the opposition, the norm of legitimizing the opposition so that the opposition in the political realm are not treated as enemies, but as, uh, as common citizens, but who are opponents in a uh, uh, political, uh, in, polit in politics. The integrity of rights is a pillar of, de of democratic power, the, the establishment and protection of basic human rights, and then the establishment of public spaces of deliberation and reason um, are necessary for the power of the people and the regulation of the public. Uh, we could probably list many more pillars of, uh, of democratic power, but those uh, five are at least uh, very important. Um, these pillars uh, and thereby democratic power, the power of the people are uh, threatened by a variety of, of threats. Uh, one of them is polarization. Uh, others are exclusionary membership claims, uh, narrowing it, uh, who belongs in the political, uh, political community. Economic uh, inequality is a threat to democratic power, the uh, shrinking of the middle class, the concentration of wealth in, a, in an elite uh, is a threat to democracy, as well as concentration of political power, executive aggrandizement is also a threat, uh, as well as the coercion of democratic norms and the uh, undermining the legitimacy of, uh, of fact-based truth are, are, uh, are also threats. I want to focus uh, on uh, polarization and exclusionary membership claims uh, in what follows. So political uh, and political polarization and exclusion as threats are, are often interconnected and they are based upon uh, the social psychological uh, finding of a, in, a tendency for in-group bias and out-group hostility. Uh, there is a tendency among uh, human beings, perhaps based in our evolutionary history, uh, for to be biased in favor of one's in-group and uh, to display out-group hostility. And when uh, that becomes extreme, there occurs an alignment uh, between social and political identity. When one's social identity becomes aligned with one's political uh, identity, when they become merged, uh, then politics becomes about group, about the groups winning, about a political victory, and uh, not about the common good. So when there's an alignment of social and political identity, as opposed to multiple identities, then, um, then politics becomes about victory and not about the just and effective regulation of the And uh, this, uh, this polarization is exacerbated by uh, many original exclusions or formative original exclusions from equal political membership around the uh, characteristics of, of race, gender, social class, and ethnicity. Uh, these uh, exclusions grounded in uh, formative, uh, formative rifts at the basis of our society, uh, they fortify social status, social status and political hierarchies. And this occurs when uh, citizenship is feathered to identity characteristics. So political uh, polarization is exacerbated by uh, exclusionary tendencies around original exclusions. In turn, uh, this, these uh, political polarizations and exclusions uh, can be weaponized politically Become, and become political strategies. And I think this is what uh, uh, Janet and Jeff were discussing in terms of the ideological apparatus, in terms of neoliberalism, and as well as the demo uh, 
uh, demagogic uh, demagogic tendencies in uh, weaponizing democracy against itself. And this has been used uh, classically, Carl Schmitt uh, uh, gave a classic formulation of this by uh, to uh, intentionally demonize or create the political opponent as an enemy as a way of uh, creating greater polarization. Uh, Newt Gingrich, Gingrich in his famous 94 memo, uh, he advocated that uh, Republicans uh, denigrate uh, Democrats by using a series of pejorative uh, descriptors for Democrats, which was uh, the beginning of our current polarization. So uh, polarization uh, can be weaponized internally within the uh, within particular political groups. It, it also, as we well know, can be weaponized externally by external actors using information warfare techniques, et cetera. So uh, polarization, political polarization can also be used as a political strategy and has been. The consequences are numerous. The consequences of uh, political polarization are nu numerous, um, and they that it, in in particular it undermines the moral and political power of the people relative to the state by weakening the pillars of democracy, and thereby narrowing the corridor of liberty, and the possibility of the effective and just regulation of the public. It does this in a variety of ways, including uh, in-group victory being uh, prevalent over the out-group becomes the sole priority. It leads to the delegitimization of the opposition and disdain for the opposition. Uh, it, it causes uh, civil discourse and reasonable public deliberation to break down into decisive rhetoric. It uh, it results in a decline of cooperation, reasonable disagreement, compromise, toleration. It leads to anger-driven political activism instead of reason-driven participation. Uh, it prevents a social class, economic, and political solidarity. It pits, for example, working class people of different ethnicities against each other. It and uh, fundamentally, it leads uh, to the centralization of executive power and the potential capture of the state by elite interests because it, uh, it, it causes paralysis, usually in the legislative branches of government, thereby leading to a increased uh, uh, concentration of power in the executive uh, branches of government among many other consequences. So political polarization is a significant uh, and harm, harmful threat to, uh, to democracy and the just and effective regulation of the public. Uh, there are probably many possible uh, solutions uh, to the restoration of uh, civil discourse in the, and public de de deliberation. Um, I, I believe that uh, the primary solution requires a shift from a, in the general population from an ethno ethnocentric perspective to a world centric, centric perspective. And that world centric perspective would include uh, forging and fostering a superordinate comics, common civic identity as well as a, a respect based uh, approach to toleration. Um, I know I'm running out of time, but uh, briefly, the, uh, the idea of a common ident civic identity uh, could, be, could possibly be grounded in shared political principles and ideals. And uh, Abraham Lincoln and Franklin Roosevelt uh, gave nod to this, uh, to this idea that what uh, what is our common bond is not our race or our ancestry or our ethnic origin, 
uh, but it is a affirmation of our fundamental values in principle. And if we can uh, gain a overlapping consensus or an agreement around uh, shared principles and values that, uh, that would counter the, uh, the polarization, the effect of polarization. So an identity, a civic identity based in commonly shared principles is one possibility. This would lead to a res respect conception of toleration, which uh, is based in reciprocal recognition across differences, respecting uh, every person uh, as moral and political equals, as free and equal citizens. And that uh, toleration of difference uh, would be grounded in the, or grounded in a shared moral uh, basis of respect which links back to the acceptance of fundamental uh, values and principles that could be shared. Uh, so to toler toleration is often based in a per permission conception that is uh, not based on respect, but uh, compliance by the minority uh, to the majority will. We'll, we'll tolerate you if you comply with our, our dictates. The respect conception of toleration is, uh, flips that and says that we, we, uh, we establish a basic um, shared uh, respect for, e for each other. And that allows us to, um, to see the commonality that we share, but also to, uh, to recognize our, our differences and to uh, uh, solve our, our uh, our differences in, uh, in a respectful manner. And I believe that uh, peace studies uh, education uh, could speak and should speak to the, to the forging of a common political identity and uh, respect-based uh, uh, toleration. So uh, thank you. Oh, thank you so much to those of you who are here and stayed through that and for your uh, being here and for our great contributions of my colleagues. And now we invite your questions and your um, uh, thoughts, challenges, <laughs> appreciations. One thing that occurs to me is that in this time of polarization, when we can be very angry at our institutions of government, we paradoxically need to support our government. And how do we do that? How do we bring it more towards a democratic support and not a demagogic obedience? How do we, how do we act in relation to that? I mean, I'm wondering what you think, or anything else of interest you'd like to bring up. I think I have a like a practical question, especially for the last presentation. Um, like I can see how we can kind of play under the same rules and look for ways of tolerate the other or the others um, that don't think the same as I do or like to have this political dialogue with others. But I think there is there is a, like, like this in theory sounds very good, but I think in particular when we already have a situation that is very conflictive, either because the government is, um, has so much power or like, for example, in, in my country that we have a, like, like an internal conflict, uh, there are certain circumstances in which these um, ideas of kind of, I don't know how to say that, but 
kind of playing under the rules and being tolerant I'm just impractical and and I'm not saying that I'm not saying to take any by force or something like that what I'm saying is like we need something to kind of get the track back again or like to have like like a like an environment that is safe for everyone and sometimes I feel like that is not the case and actually um I was having the conversation with someone this week about how even a personality like uh, like Trump would take advantage of the people who are respectful, and he would uh, use that like person, people being so tolerant and respecting like like an advantage in using them in a way. So I think. I don't know. I don't, I don't even know. I don't have an answer and I don't know, but I, I just think that we need like a kind of bridge between being super civilized mm-hmm. and when the situation is really, really messed up. Well, I, I uh, Anna Maria, I think you uh, raise an important, important question and issue uh, that on, under you, if I'm understanding your point correctly, uh, that polarization intense polarization will lead to intense resentment um, and hostility across the, across the divide. And that, uh, that resentment has to be healed, uh, uh, transformed uh, in order to reach a more civil, uh, civil state of respect and, and respect-based toleration. So, uh, and that can only, I think that can only occur through, uh, through um, creating public spaces or creating opportunities for, uh, for people to actually talk to each other and to potentially listen to each other in a, in a respectful way. That, okay, uh, why, do you, why do you support this line? Uh, what, are your, what are your reasons? Can you explain to me uh, why you're you've taken the position that you are. I wanna understand, I wanna understand what your, what your resentments are, what your issues are. Uh, can, we, can we talk about it instead of blaming each other or, uh, or uh, uh, continually to uh, compete with each other for, for power. So that's, and, and that's a, you know, there are there are many people more uh, more expert in that in that process than I, but it seems to me uh, opening to uh, opening spaces of communication is the uh, maybe one of the first steps to pursue. Right. I, I wonder. I wonder what you think about that. No, I, I was just thinking like I wasn't thinking in terms of people who have like the same power, but I was thinking in dynamics of power when mm. one of the parties have like 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 a lot of power that is impossible to have these type of dialogues. Um, if you were talking right. about the government, or right. we, we are talking about armed uh, organizations, mm. right? There is no way to come to the moment to speak and, and heal yeah. or have dialogue. Okay. There is no yeah. dialogue when it's violence or dynamics of powers in between the two. So yeah. that, that was okay. more my question. Thank yeah. you. Can I, can I, that's a great question that gets right to the essence of what we're trying to get at. Mostly we've come from a very, uh, we're talking <laughs> for one thing, right? And it's, you know, very intellectual, our perspective, although we have grounded experience. Could I ask what country you're from? Oh yeah, so sorry. I am Colombian. I am from Colombia. Okay. Yeah, we, we actually have a lot of familiarity with Colombia from working with people, working closely with there and uh, having international institute and education there and working with um, what's Amada's organization, uh, Educación por la Paz, what's, I don't know. We work with people who are working there. And, yeah, I and, think, yeah, I think it's Educación para la Paz, yes. You, you know, uh, Amada Benavides de Perez, no, anyway. I, I'm not sure. 
Um, um, in, in Augusto Boal, in the theater of the oppressed, a Brazilian activist would say that there's no theater of the oppressed, there's no democracy when you're up against a firing squad. There's no space for negotiation in the face of guns. And so it's not those people really, I think, that you can have a discussion with. And, and, and it's so heartbreaking, as in Colombia, where so much work was made to do, make peace accords and then it, the peace accords are violated so shamelessly, right? And uh, I don't know who else would like to address this question of how of public spaces or how do we, where do we find the space for these uh, practices of toleration, respect, dialogue, well, and, and deliberation? Yeah. I um, I like to talk about the public space of education. Um, I have a maybe the thing that I'm trying to figure out how to add to my courses. I mean, I, I, I haven't I haven't built it into the syllabus. On the one hand, as a conference committee, we, we knew that polarization was a big deal. But in terms of thinking about how to teach it, I think I was actually thinking more of avoiding the subject to go over the other stuff and try to keep the class present. But um, I have this slide, you, you've probably seen it in some, some place or another, but I feel like this is one of these tools to talk about. On the one hand, we do have a reality of polarization and I think part of what the presentations, I think, really revealed, especially the detail about Newt Gingrich in 1994, I just have to say, like, that it was really helpful for me to see that there was this strategic weaponized use of derogatory and pejorative labeling in order to create the emnification. I'm sure liberals have emnified the other as well, but to, to have that reminder that we're situating a conversation in a longer arc of instead of arguing substance, we've been arguing character for a long time. But anyway, so this this slide here um, reveals, a, a, I think, a clear sci psychological detail that when we show the states as either being red or blue, um, we do create the appearance of a much more divided and polarized America than when we show it as the shade according to margin of victory. And, you know, the person who studied it, right, says when people were shown this image, they perceived the country as less polarized. So if educators can take back the space to say, we can't guarantee comfort in classrooms, but we can guarantee safety, and we can have meaningful conversations about politics, I, I feel like that's at least one of the mechanisms where we can get back to these pillars of democracy where it's substance, right? Being hard on substance and not on people. That's great. And I just like to pick up on this really fundamental point that you referred to in conflict resolution, one of the very first things you learn in you know, conflict resolution on the first day is try to separate the people from the problems. But polarization, and then you can look at the problems as a team. And in polarization, it's the opposite. Blame the people, accuse the other people, and sort of nudge away from the real problem that we're trying to solve. Let's, uh, uh, Eric Byrne, this, uh, he started a branch of uh, psychology and therapy called transactional analysis. And he had named, the, he had this book, Games People Play. And one of the games was, let's you and him fight. And certainly our governments do that in our polarization. And the media does that too by showing and labeling huge swaths as red against blue. 
Well, I, I think that uh, we are not blameless. Uh, the practitioners, uh, uh, am I okay? Am I, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. I, I think um, the practitioners of uh, peace studies and peace education are not blameless. I think we need a great deal of self-reflection on the language we use on the assumptions we make when we describe positions, when we out outline problematic and so forth. Um, the other thing that seems to me we need to get at is the actual human behavioral dimension of what we're calling here the problematic of polarization. Polarization is people. It's people who are alienated from sometimes from their neighbors, sometimes from their family. And the, the primary thing is how do we develop those skills of communication, which will enable us one-on-one -on -one or in public spaces to begin to transcend that alienation. And I don't think it is, uh, all, I don't think that the uh, language and concept of conflict resolution and uh, various other uh, theories on communication are up to it. I think it, it's something a lot, a lot deeper. Yes. Um, I was very struck by an assignment my uh, great niece had in a freshman uh, political science course and, uh, and it went to this getting at the humanity. I thought it was a brilliant strategy. Um, the professor asked them if they would be willing to identify themselves as liberal conservative or um, middle of the road or whatever. And then um, on that basis, she paired the students and the, what they were to discuss was not their positions, but how do you think you came to believe what you believe? What were your experiences? What has your life been that brings you to this point? And um, what my niece reported to me was a very fruitful conversation between two youngsters who would not have been able to talk to each other if they had been put into the usual paradigm of making the political argument. And that's just one thing, but I, I, I really think we've got to start developing uh, a professional repertoire for opening communication whatever the space, whether it's a public space or private space. That also has a, uh, an important, right? important conception no, of, or, or okay. element of self-reflection, that exercise that really You'd have to, the student would have to really think and reflect on where, what was the origin of their, of their belief system. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's very powerful, I yeah. agree. Uh, polarization, and that's, I think, uh, polarization uh, uh, results in the striving for victory over others rather than seeking commonality or any kind of compromise. Yeah. Um, and the, I think, Betty, that your example suggests that uh, a way to transcend that attitude of victory is to, is to deeply reflect on, on why we hold the beliefs we hold. Yeah, I think that's, that's a very important starting point for all of us. And also to kind of check in periodically on how are our beliefs changing and yeah. why? Yeah. And are we, uh, we on the left, uh, 
also guilty of uh, pursuing victory. Well, I, we... perceive, I perceive that a lot of times in the argument because mm -hmm. the, the argument is constructed to invalidate the argument of the other, not to try to find something in the mm -hmm. argument of the other that uh, we can relate to, that can, that can be uh, something that we understand in ourselves. I could think that. Maybe I don't think it, but I understand that thought. And okay. once you, you really get to understand some of the thought of the other, I think then the communication becomes much more possible. Agree. Okay. Great. Other comments? I, I would I would characterize what you described, Betty, is um, opening up. I think in peace education, we're not looking to just solve problems. We're really looking to build relationships and connect and have life and these problems illuminated by the others, by opening a conversation and learning from others. As even as as the professor or the student or whoever, we all are learners, and that's your you know core to your work, and that's our work too. Other comments, questions, rejections. <laughs> Je Jeff, does this conversation uh, relate to your points about reification and softening? softening up that reification. Yeah, I think that, that, that the practice of critically reflecting I th really resonates, I think. What, where, what is the source of this and how can I come to um, sort of interrogate the, the, those beliefs and the source of those beliefs and how they're, they're, they're held? I, I think it also points to some of the, the epistemic claims, right? And we become hardened in our beliefs um, unwilling to, to revise even one in the face of evidence and even in the face of hearing another person's perspective. And I, and I think that relates to your superordinate identity, right? Of how do we see the other human being? We see that if we see them as an equal human being, they're of equal dignity, we see them as being redeemable. And I think that when Wim was talking earlier about his interest in forgiveness, I think that comes out of that. Seeing that person is, is a redeemable human being um, with, with, um, with a subjective experience that we want to hear and we want to authentically connect to them um, by communicating, I think to Betty's point, uh, by communicating to them in ways that we can, we can connect with, right? It's, it's presenting our case in a way that's, that's authentic, but also in a way that that person can understand um, and I think that gets to the very point of the idea of public reason that, that you discussed from Rawls as well. Is that, um, how, what, what is the language that we're using? And are we showing that proper respect for that other person? Nice. Um, let me make some closing re remarks so that we can. Um... I'd like to add one thing. Do you want to share? Do you do it after you? Um, may I add one thing? Should I go after you, Wim? Yeah. Well, I was I was just gonna say that we could I could make the remarks, we could end the recording and continue the conversation as long as people wanted to stay. Um so the only question is would you like to make sure that your observation is recorded? Yes. Yes, and um, so my, my just that uh, we have this International Institute on Peace Education, IIPE, which is constructed to be a learning community and to bring people together with an emphasis on learning and listening and ex with to and with each other around a certain problematic, usually country centric and the Next one will be in, uh, in Mexico next summer. And um, that 
it's not so much problem solving, but everyone really is changed by that experience. So that is one kind of space that we create that's educational, but also edging towards more political understanding. Okay, thank you. And, and one other point to share is I learned that if you turn off your video, it can help with instability in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, yeah, in the uh, internet, in these kinds of talks. Did you get that? Yeah, yeah. okay. Okay, yeah, thank no. you for the minute, thank you. No, no any, anybody else who wants to make sure that they have a final remark before we end the recording, I didn't mean to uh, become tyrannical. I just was trying to be thoughtful <laughs> of the time. Um, yeah, I, I, your your institute. I I'm a big fan. Um, I'll keep applying to try to go to those events because I think that that is again the way that we create spaces. Uh, many times is by bringing people together, and I'm just you know. Um, I, my, my, my comment, I think, to some regard is to say that on the one hand, I think the critical self-reflexivity, the, the deep critical exchange with others is, um, is a work in progress. And I think it's something that I see everybody in our Peace and Justice Studies organization um, engaging in kind of all the time. And, you know, I don't see any of the kind of the laziness um, on the whole, but I guess, I mean, that is the real challenge. I mean, I said that we knew we were doing it for the conference, but I didn't want to do it for my classroom. You know, I knew it was a big, a heavy lift to say, um, that I would want to make that deep dive. And I think in so many ways, what I appreciate the most about the three different frameworks and how they work together is that I think it really offers a, a, a fantastic uh, pedagogical format for creating the orientation to polarization by which we bring it up as something that our founders and our framers uh, were deeply aware of and the steps that they took in order to try to create the opportunities for polarized exchanges, but also to contain and control the extent to which we would leave kind of this democratic pathway to, um, you know, too much power to a leader versus too much power to society and so forth. Um, so I really appreciate the exchange. I really have also appreciated the, uh, the comments. And um, yeah, so I'll, we'll, we'll end the recording now.